So I'm going to talk about the work that we're doing in the Nissan Research Center Lab in Silicon Valley especially. We work closely with our counterparts in Japan at Nissan in research to develop the intelligent smart car of the future for autonomous driving. And this takes a lot more than just a straight technical expertise with all the right technology and know-how of putting it together, but also an understanding of society and how people move and interact and behave with vehicles, both inside a vehicle and on the outside of a vehicle. So let me sort of set up by talking about what we're really hoping to achieve. We want to create autonomous driving in the future that's harmonious with society. We have a sense that we want to keep people's participation with vehicles and their interactions, which have been so formative to how we live in the world, um, as part of how we move forward with this development. So there's two values that we are trying to achieve. One is that we build our technology and how it works effectively and meaningfully together with a driver. And the second is that we, whoops, sorry, did I just get out of the right mode here? Want to create autonomous vehicles that are harmonious with society. And what we mean by this is that when we feel their existence in the world, that they are harmonious with the ways that we go about our everyday lives. And as you see, that's a bigger challenge, perhaps, than you might realize if you stop to think of all the variations in ways that we um, work and, and move in the world. So let's look at a few examples. On the first, I'm going to play some video. There's, this is going to have a lot of video, so hopefully it'll be viewable for you. And I can always uh, back up and, and uh, play things again. But I'm just going to show you some examples of variations of what might be good road use practices. So on the left here, this one's starting to go. We have a typical four-way stop intersection in a small town in the peninsula of California. And what you see is the order taking in a four-way stop. Now, what's interesting is that car number two back there was the second to arrive. But all those numbers you see flashing show how other cars go forward before it does. But this makes a lot of sense in this context because what happened at the very beginning, and I'll go ahead and play it again, is that there was a, um, as that car number two arrived, this is car number one, that's car number two, the pedestrian was blocking, so obviously couldn't go. Then the truck turning was blocking. So again, sort of delayed, he could have snuck forward there, but this one goes, and since that one's going, then the fourth one decides it can go. We as humans can figure out and perceive those kinds of instances instantaneously and make judgments about how to, to take action and move forward. Again, what our goal is then is to figure out how can we teach that to cars. Now, here's a situation in Sao Paulo, Brazil that looks quite different. We have pedestrians trying to go, moving across, trying to stop the traffic, putting up their arms, and the cars trying to make progress and moving through. Now, I'm not saying this is actually socially unacceptable in that context. In fact, we were precisely brought there to look at this because it was understood, everybody understood that for anybody to get anywhere, this is how it needed to work. So it was sort of accepted and agreed to, but it looks fairly aggressive and, and difficult to, to want to step forward into that unless you're already familiar with it. So for us, when we think about autonomy, we have to think about what it means to build autonomy that will be socially acceptable and working together with humans. So why is this? Well, human beings, for which vehicles and transportation are, are built and by whom they're designed, are inherently social beings. We're collective beings. We, we rely on each other and work together to get things done. We do this through interaction and communication. So what does that mean in this world of autonomous vehicles? Well, in the past, often with technology, I actually am relatively new to the automotive industry, but I have a long background doing work in um, high tech and with technology. And it's a well-known principle that we want to make our technology and objects that we interact with intuitive, easy to use, pleasurable if possible. 
But what we're finding as we go further into states of autonomy is that we actually need to think not just of using an object and it's going to be a passive thing that we control, but that we're going to be increasingly, and we already experienced this in some other technologies, interacting and having a relationship, an ongoing relationship with that technology. So the questions that we ask at Nissan are what does this mean for those who are inside the car, and I would say that so far in the development of autonomous vehicles and the fantasies about the future that's coming, people are especially interested in how it's going to change the experience of drivers and what kind of technological interfaces are going to make it more suitable for those in, these, in this transition period when we have to have safety drivers or people are taking control, transitioning back and forth between the car driving and them driving, the car driving and them driving. Uh, so what, are, what is that experience inside the car going to be? But again, as those examples we've already looked at suggest, we have to also think about what is the experience for people on the outside of the car. So the, the proverbial situation to think of here in a f further future with fully driverless vehicles, if there's no driver there, that you're trusting to interpret that social situation and make the same judgments that you would, and you can't make eye contact and there's nobody there to look at as a pedestrian or another driver, what's going to happen? So we need to understand how the interactions will happen between autonomous vehicles and all other road users from the outside as well. So what does this mean for the vehicles in the car? So this is the artificial intelligence portion of this talk. Um, and this is kind of a, a very simple diagram of how artificial intelligence works. In fact, how, how intelligence works. That we are taking in perception, we're perceiving things, we use our senses to identify, to first perceive and experience things in the world. We then begin to name them and categorize them and give them identities that we can place them and decide what kind of thing is this. Is it safe or dangerous? Is it cute and cuddly or is it something that makes me uh, angry? We begin to sort of perceive those kinds of experiences. Based on what we perceive, we can make decisions about the actions to take. But then even once there's a decision made, then we have to act on it and control it. Now, I come from a tradition of science and research. I'm actually a social scientist by training, so that's about as much depth in technology that you're going to get from me. I'm an anthropologist by training, and what we know, those in the human and social sciences, is that this is a very, very complex act that does not always follow this linear sequence at all, and it's very situationally specific. So, so people are going back and forth between these different levels constantly in some very complex manners affected by the environment. But what we need to do is build in predictability for our cars so that, they, that people will know how they behave, can trust them, and expect them to behave in certain ways, and that we can count on them doing that as well. So what is it going to mean for an autonomous vehicle to be able to learn to sense and perceive, to decide, and then to be able to act on that? So let's look at this situation. We in our lab, I, th I think I already mentioned this in, in Silicon Valley, are um, focused especially on um, autonomous driving for cities. So this, this is a much more complex task to figure out how to do something about that than on highways. Because on highways, we're all going roughly the same speed in the same direction without cross traffic for the most part, the stray animal, those sorts of things that can happen. We have to deal with lane changes and stuff. In cities, though, we are constantly in these, in these situations where we intersect with others. They're very, very intersection-heavy kinds of environments and therefore interaction-heavy environments. So what do we need to do technologically? First, we have to understand other drivers or other road users, pedestrians, bicycles, anything on the road. What are its intentions? What is it going to do? And then again, we have to not only decide what we should do in response, but we should have a way of acting on that and then communicating to others about that action so that they can understand our intentions. So there's many different layers to this. So let's just look at this simple instance of this T-stop, a three-way stop. 
If this yellow car is the autonomous vehicle, we can begin to think about what the intentions of this blue car would be. It is, with most certainty, going to either turn left or right. Now, there's some very slim probability that it could actually do a U-turn or do something completely crazy, you know, run into whatever's over there. But, you know, we have a fairly strong prediction that it can go either way. If it's going to turn right, it's not in conflict with us, and we don't need to worry about its intentions, and we can decide and continue to act. If it's going to turn left, then we do have to pay attention to its intentions and how it will act. It's complicated now by the fact that we have a pedestrian there that's going this way. Now we want to understand the intentions of this pedestrian, too. Well, that's really hard because, you know, people can turn on a dime. I can suddenly stop and go the other direction much more easily than a car could. Um, and, of course, people are people, and so who knows what they might actually do. But again, there's a certain amount of predictability to the, the likelihood that if you see them walking in this direction, there's a crosswalk, things like that, that they're going to continue in those ways. And we work with uh, very complex modeling systems that, that work on those sort of predictive capabilities. So the very simple point here, though, is that if this pedestrian walks in front of this car, now this car is blocked. So even if it's turning left, then it's very likely that I would have a chance, nonetheless, as an autonomous vehicle to go forward. But again, I would not only want to decide that and act on it, but it'd be really good if I could signal to the other uh, road users that that's what I'm doing in some manner. So we have to have these two parts, the, the interpretation and understanding of others, and then the, signaling, the taking action and signaling ourselves. So let's play this out a little bit. So this is the kinds of models that we build to actually help autonomous vehicles get through intersections. We, we build what we call an intersection logic that, that helps them specifically in these sorts of situations. And basically, there are four states of action that a, a car can take at this point. It can drive, it can stop, it can yield, or it can cross. But if you see here, and we're going to walk through these, yield is not just one thing. There's many different ways of yielding, as it turns out, and many different sort of moods that would come with that yielding. So let's just sort of look at this a little bit. First, we have, if you watch a... I'm sorry, can we ask questions? Sure. Can you go back to that last one? Sure, the slide before? Sorry. Um, you're saying that's what the car is doing or that's what the human is doing? Uh, in fact, all road users would be doing a version of this, but this is what we're building our cars to do. Okay. Yeah. So this is the, the overarching sort of top level logic and system that we would use to guide our cars through an intersection. Any other? I, I kept talking. I talk fast a little bit sometimes. It's my family's New Yorker in them. Uh, so, okay, so we'll continue and look at these cars. So, again, the yellow car is the autonomous vehicle. They're driving, they're driving, they're driving. Look, the blue car has arrived. It's now stopped. So, the yellow car has come to its stop. It's now in the stop state, and it knows that the blue car was first. It's perceived and judged that the blue car arrived first. Now, think of any even small city intersection. How certain are we that we all saw that the same way? that we all agree exactly who arrived when and whose turn it is. There's a lot of interpretation and very micro-scale kind of negotiation that we go through to, to sort of signal and come to some collective agreement about, oh, okay, you went first, I thought I was, but I'll let you go, th those sorts of things. But in this case, it was pretty clear. So what our car is going to do is it's going to go into a very polite and relatively passive yield state that says, I'm really yielding. No ambiguity about this. It's your turn. You go. And in fact, we could do something like signal in some manner if we had a signaling device on the car that says, I'm in a more passive mode. I don't plan to go anywhere. And the other road users can interpret that as saying, OK, therefore, it's probably safe for me to go. So that's, that's fairly straightforward. But again, it doesn't always go like that. Now, what about in this case where the car now begins to turn? By the way, when we signal, sometimes it's very um, unintentional, and we don't actively mean to be signaling. And it comes with our other actions. So we signal a lot through our own body motion. We do this as people. Cars do it as well. A tire turn, starting to sort of creep into an intersection, slowly rolling. These are all signals to people about a next intention.